Well, good morning, Redeemer. It is a privilege, as always, to gather together with the body of Christ to worship the Lord, to pray, and in just a moment to hear the preaching of God's Word. My name is Chris Lejeune, and I serve as one of the pastors here at the church. Before we get started, before we, we dive into the text that Leah just read for us, there are two announcements that I just want to quickly highlight this morning. The first one is that on Sunday, the 4th of September, so two weeks from now, we're going to be gathering in this room at 9 a.m. So that's an hour and a half before the service starts at 9 a.m. for our first Sunday prayer gathering, which is exactly what we're calling it, First Sunday Prayer. This is open to everyone, whether you're a member or not. Uh, kids as well, everyone is welcome. And the idea is that on the first Sunday of every month, we're going to gather together, and it'll be a time for us to hear testimonies of people sharing what's been going on in their lives th this coming uh, Sunday. It'll be about what's happened over the summer, stories of evangelism and personal growth. Uh, and this will be an opportunity for us to just give, uh, hear this, give, uh, give thanks for what God has been doing, and to pray for, for these things. And also be a time where we can pray for specific things that are happening in the life of our church. Uh, praying for other churches and various things happening both locally here in the UAE and globally. And in the last part of that time, we'll have about a 10-minute exhortation from God's Word. Our goal is to be done by latest, 10.10 at which point you'll be able to go and check kids into Redeemer Kids, grab a cup of coffee, say hi to some friends, and then make our way in here before the service starts. As I mentioned, everyone is welcome, uh, so please do make sure that you mark your calendars Sunday, the 4th of September, 9 a.m. The second thing I do want to highlight, and, and Pastor Joe made mention of it of his, in his prayer today, is for us to be um, praying for the focus week that is t starting today and will go until the 28th of August, next week, Sunday. For those who don't know, focus, it's the Fellowship of Christian UAE Students. It's a parachurch ministry that seeks to engage with university students throughout the UAE. And starting today, around 50 students are going get to get together with volunteers from Focus. And as Joe mentioned, they're going to be getting together to study a manuscript study of the entire Gospel of Mark. An entire week of just studying God's Word. Doesn't that just sound incredible? Studying God's Word together. Please, friends, let me encourage you to be in prayer for this time. God has used this week specifically to impact the lives of many. And we continue to pray that he would continue to do that uh, this coming week. So I'm going to pray for these two things, and then we will get started. Let me pray. Father God, uh, we do thank you and praise you for the privilege that it is to gather together on the Lord's Day on a Sunday. And Father, we do want to continue to lift up this focus week that is starting today, Lord, we thank you for how you have used that week to impact the lives of many who don't know you, many who may be asking questions, many who are, are seeking, how you have used this week to bring so many to a saving knowledge of who you are. Lord, we thank you for that and pray that you will continue to do that. Prepare the hearts of all those students that are going. Prepare them even now for what is to come this week. Pray that you would be with those volunteers. And Lord, as the week comes to an end, as this week of, of studying your word comes to an end, may everyone who is there go away in awe, praising you for who you are. And Father God, we also look ahead to two weeks' time when we will gather in this room to spend some time corporately praying together, hearing testimonies of what you have been doing in and through this church and beyond over the, the, this past summer. Lord, we pray that this would be a sweet time of fellowship, a, a sweet time of encouragement, and just as we come together to, to submit ourselves and to present our prayers and requests to you, we pray that you would do a mighty work through this time together. And our Father, as we come to the preaching of your word, Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to respond to what your word is calling us to. 
Father, may we submit ourselves to the authority of what your scriptures say. Father, I do pray that you would be with me, give me wisdom. Lord, use me as a broken vessel to be faithful in proclaiming your word. Lord, that we may all walk walk away from here in awe of you, praising your glorious name. And it's the glorious name of Jesus that we do pray these things. Amen. On the 6th of September, 22 years ago, in the year 2000, for the first time, TV viewers were introduced to the show CSI, Crime Scene Investigation. It followed a group of forensic detectives who would piece together various bits of evidence found at a crime scene to try solve the crime and catch the bad guy. The show was marked by various little clips of how the evidence may have got there and of how the the detectives believed this crime had taken place as they tried to understand what happened. They showed why something as obvious as a footprint or something as seemingly small and insignificant as an insect bite could be the key piece of evidence that would crack the case. And in our passage this morning, while we aren't necessarily looking at a crime scene, we are faced with various details and clues that are pieced together that leave us with this main overarching point. So if you're taking notes, this is our main point today. Just one big heading that we're looking at, and it's this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. So if you haven't already done so, friends, let me encourage you to open to John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. We are fast approaching the end of this gospel. After today, we simply have three sermons left. And while we have already seen so much, there are some incredible encouragements and truths for us to take away from these next few weeks. Our passage today begins in the early morning. Look with me again at verse 1. Now Mary, on the first day of the week, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. John in his gospel highlights Mary specifically. We know from the other gospel accounts that she wasn't alone. But perhaps because of Mary's interaction with Christ later, John singles her out. Now she's making her way to the tomb where Jesus had been buried. Remember last week, Pastor John Butchen took us through the account of the crucifixion. Jesus had been taken off the tomb and then placed, uh, taken off the cross and then placed in a tomb in a garden near where he had been crucified. And there was a, a sense of hastiness, a rush to get him buried, because not only was it soon the start of the Sabbath at sundown, but it was also the time of the Passover Sabbath, a a high day in Jewish festivals. And once the Sabbath begun, none of the disciples would have been able to do any kind of work, let alone go near a dead body. They had to prepare Christ's body as quickly as possible and put him in the tomb. Once the sun was down, the first opportunity anyone would have had would, to, to go to the tomb would be that Sunday, the first day of the week. Now, it suggested that Mary went to the tomb since the body of Jesus had not been able to be properly prepared for burial. Essentially, she, it suggested that she was going to the tomb to finish what Simon and Nicodemus had started. The text tells us that it was still dark. Now, it is interesting to note, if you may be going through this passage this week, that the other, gospels, uh, other gospel writers do use different times of the day. Matthew says that it was toward the dawn. Mark says that they went when the sun had already risen. And Luke says it was at early dawn. So what are we to make of this? It may seem like a small thing, but in the context of John's gospel, I believe that he's said that very intentionally. So just very quickly, here are three things as to why I think he's, he's been so intentional in saying that it was dark. One, it highlights the sense of urgency. It highlights this urgency that Mary and the other ladies had that they, in wanting to get to the tomb. 
They could have waited till the sun was up, but they wanted to com- get to the tomb to complete the burial procedure that Jesus' body had not been able to receive due to the nearness of the Sabbath. They wanted to honor him as soon as they could. The second reason is that they perhaps didn't want to be seen. Considering how Jesus had been falsely accused, how he had been unfairly convicted and crucified just two days before, it's safe to assume that anyone showing sympathy or or being connected with Jesus could have found themselves in serious trouble. Going by cover of darkness could have been a way for them to do what they needed to do in, in relative safety. And then the third reason, I think, is this. The fact that they were still figuratively in the dark. Now, throughout the Gospel of John, the mention of darkness has been associated with those that are spiritually in the dark, those that that didn't understand the truth. They didn't understand the truth about Christ. If we turn our Bibles to the start of this Gospel, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 9, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God. Uh, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. In these first verses of the Gospel of John, we're seeing John making this distinction between light and darkness. And then we think, we jump ahead to uh, John chapter 3. Remember the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes by the cover of night. Why? Well, as we saw when we studied that text together, yes, he was not wanting to be seen, but also he was a man who did not see the truth. He did not understand. He was a teacher of Israel, yet he was in the dark. And as we come back to our passage, while the disciples believed that Jesus was the Son of God, that obviously witnessed his miracles, they had been with him for three years, as we will see, In many ways, they were still in the dark. They were still in the dark as to the understanding that Christ would rise from the dead. John's use of dark here in this passage highlights this. Look with me back at the text. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid them. Mary and the others get to the tomb, without even getting close, without even seemingly entering the tomb, they recognize that this scene is not how it should be. This stone that was covering the entrance has been rolled away. And the area is is seemingly deserted. Fearing the worst, they run to Peter and the other disciple, who we know to be John, the writer of this gospel. She she tells them of the situation. I got there. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Peter and John hear this from Mary, and their response is is the same, one of haste. They make their way to the tomb. Verse 3, so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were both going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. So so, so John, being the, the, the quicker of the two, he arrives at the tomb, looks inside, but doesn't go in. He surveys the scene. He sees the linen cloths, the ones that have been used to wrap up Christ's body, simply lying there. Simon Peter arrives And in typical Simon Peter fashion, really not thinking before acting, he just goes straight into the tomb. Once he's in there, he too, he sees that the linen cloth that had been used to wrap up Christ is just simply lying there. 
But then it tells us that he also sees the face cloth, the one that had been used to cover Jesus' face. Not with the other linen, but folded up and placed in a separate place. Now this is where we need to start putting on our detective hats, as it were. Start examining the evidence that's at hand. What are we to make of the empty tomb? We know from Matthew's gospel that a guard had been requested by the priests and set in place for fear that the disciples might actually come and steal Christ's body and claim that he had been risen from the dead. So access to the tomb, access to get to the tomb itself would have been difficult. Then, of course, there's this massive stone that would need to be moved. It had been a Sabbath day where no work was to be done. So, so going to the tomb before the Sunday would raise suspicion, specifically if, if they were heading there, if, if it was under the guise of some work. They, they weren't allowed to on the Sabbath. Then, of course, there's the risk of stealing the body. Grave robbing was a capital offense. If someone was caught stealing the, the, a, a, a dead body, the punishment was death. Now, let's keep all of this in the back of our minds as we consider the tomb with Peter and John. Assuming someone had managed to somehow get rid of the guard, rolled the stone away, gotten their hands on the body. I mean, for one thing, this is all something that would really require a degree of, of haste, of speed. If you knew that being caught trying to, to rob a cave a grave would carry with it the death penalty, you wouldn't want to hang around. You want to be in and out as quickly as possible. And yet, what do Peter and John see? The linen cloths, the ones that had been used to, to cover Jesus' body, simply lying there where Jesus' body had been. Now, think about this. Given the danger of hand at hand, why would a grave robber take all that time to remove all of those bandages. But not only that, then take the time to take the covering that was on Jesus' face and fold it up, or as other translations put it, rolled it up neatly and put it in a separate place. Why would someone take the time to do all of that when there is such great risk involved? Not only from the Romans, given their laws, but, but from the Jewish priests as well. I mentioned earlier, the, the, the reason, one of the reasons for going early was for fear of the Jewish priests. Being associated with Jesus wasn't exactly the most popular thing to do on this day. Well, the short answer to these questions is someone wouldn't. Someone wouldn't take the risk. So what happened? Look with me at verse 8. Then the other disciple who had reached the term first, that's John, also went in. And he saw, and he believed. John enters the tomb, looks around. As he considers all the evidence that's before him, there's only one possible answer. Christ is risen. The text tell us he, tells us he saw and he believed. Now, John is clear that this belief was not because of what the Scriptures say. Verse 9, For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise from the dead. As one commentator notes, up to this point, these two disciples, like the rest of Christ's followers, had not fully understood the meaning of the Scriptures. That comes later. The Scriptures which taught that Christ must rise again from the dead after dying for our sins. But John sees and he believes. But this belief doesn't seem to be universal. It doesn't seem that everyone has it. Peter doesn't seem to have the same response. The rest of verse 9 says, then the disciples simply went back to their homes. And that's where we end with Simon, Peter, and John. Both just going back to their homes. John goes away believing because of what he had seen. Peter, we weren't too sure. John doesn't suggest that Peter believes. It could be that, he was, that Peter was perhaps perplexed as to what he had seen, maybe may amazed considering all the evidence, but as of yet, not believing. We also aren't sure why they just left and went home so suddenly. 
They, they, they didn't really just take the time to, to take everything in. They didn't even seem to interact with Mary. One suggestion as to the reason why Peter and John went away from the tomb uh, so soon was, again, the fear of the Jews. They might well expect the anger of the high priest Caiaphas and his companions on finding the tomb empty, finding that the body of Jesus was gone. And one can imagine that anger would be very, very great. And then naturally, with all this anger, they would turn their wrath on the immediate uh, um, people who they thought would do it, the disciples of Jesus. So with the day breaking, the sooner they got home, the better. Now, uh, let's just take a moment as we think through all of this. Let's just take a moment. I just want to offer us some encouragement here as we consider Simon, Peter, and John. Perhaps you're sitting here, been a Christian for a while. Perhaps you're a brand new Christian. You're sharing the gospel with a friend, with colleagues, with family members. You're holding out these truths of Scripture that we see, showing them the historical truths and even the evidence of your own life, how you have been transformed, and yet they still do not understand. They still do not believe. It may seem obvious to you, but they just don't seem to get it. Friends, let's remember that it's not our responsibility to change someone from unbelief to belief. It's not our responsibility to try and open their eyes. It is our responsibility to be faithful. Not to try and change the facts or to try and make things seem more palatable, as it were. No, 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 friends. Only God can change someone. Only He can open their eyes. We are to be faithful and trust God to reveal Himself at His perfect time. And just look at at Peter, look at John, look at Mary, three people all seeming looking at the exact same evidence, and yet, at this point, walking away with very different conclusions. John believing, Peter not really sure what to make of things, seemingly amazed, and Mary seemingly is still very much in the dark. Friends, trust God's timing. Trust God's work in the lives of those around you. At the right moment, God opened up your eyes and you believed. If you, have, if you have someone that you are pouring into and yet there is no change, remember God's timing is perfect. He is working out all things according to his perfect plan. He opened the eyes of John and then, uh, then and there to the truth that Christ had risen. For Peter... It would be later that day, which we'll look at next week. But for Mary, it would be momentarily. Look with me, starting at verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Now, despite Peter and John's response to the whole situation, Mary remains distraught, still standing outside the tomb, perhaps in utter disbelief that Christ is no longer there, thinking that his body has still been removed, it's been stolen, fearful to even look into the tomb at this point. But she does look in, perhaps because of what we read in the next verse. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet, and they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Mary's response suggests that she was consumed by the fact that Christ was missing. That she didn't notice that these two angels suddenly appeared in white where Christ had been. She doesn't go in to ask who they are or, or what they did with the body. However, their question could very well be to, to just stir up her own mind to ask the question, why am I weeping? Why did John and Peter go away seemingly not upset, not in tears? It seems that she is still very much in the dark and hasn't yet fully understood the significance of the empty tomb. She simply responds to their question and says to them, 
They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. This is really what's at the heart of Mary's grief. She doesn't know where Christ is. As far as she knows, his body has been stolen. Perhaps the reason for her not understanding or not believing that Jesus could or has been raised was because the last time she saw someone raised was Lazarus. And Christ was the one who had raised Lazarus from the dead. Then I'm with Christ dead, who's going to be able to raise Christ from the dead? It just seems like an impossible situation. But what happens next changes everything. Verse 14. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around to him and said to him in Arabic, Rabboni, which means teacher. After responding to the angels, she turns around and there is Jesus standing right in front of her. At first, she doesn't recognize who it is, perhaps because her eyes were, were still filled with tears, or, or maybe the last person she did expect to see was, in fact, Christ. For whatever reason, she thinks it's the gardener. In a moment of desperation, she asks this man in front of her if he has, in fact, taken Jesus' body away. She is desperate, desperate to find the body of Christ. She seems to have this intense love for the Lord. Now, it's suggested that no one else felt that they owed so much to Christ as Mary did. We know from Mark's account that she had been tormented and that Christ had delivered her from seven demons. None felt so strongly that there was nothing too great to do for Christ. As one pastor describes it, she was last at his cross and first at his grave. She stayed longest there and was soonest here. She could not rest until she was up to seek him. She sought him while it was yet dark, even before she had light to seek him by. In a word, having received so much from Christ, she loved him much. And in loving him much, she did much in order to prove the reality of her love. As one 18th century minister puts it, those who love Christ most are those who have received most benefit from him. Mary's love is so deep. I imagine that if this was in fact the gardener and he had taken Christ's body away and then taken, it and, and taken her and shown her where the body was, I don't doubt that she would have tried to use all of her strength to pick that body up and take it back no matter how far away it was and put it in the tomb so that Christ could be honored the way he should be to be properly prepared for burial. But it's not the gardener. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. At that moment, there is no doubt in Mary's mind who's standing in front of her. In that instant, all of her anguish, all of her pain, all of her sorrow transforms into this exuberant joy. Mary. What a beautiful picture of John chapter 10, verses 3 to 4. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, Mary, and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. She knew his voice. Friends, just, just let that reflect. Just, just, just let that sink in for just a moment. Christ calls Mary by name. Friends, if you are a Christian, if you have repented and put your faith and trust in Christ, it is because the shepherd is because Christ knows you. He has called you by name. 
and you have responded to his voice. And when you follow the Lord, when you are in the presence of the risen Christ, there is nothing else that can take your attention away. When we are in the presence of the risen King, our eyes can be fixed nowhere else but on Him. Considering where she had been in this moment of sorrow, to the fact that Christ was now standing in front of her, her Lord before her. It makes sense that she would, she would want to embrace him. She would want to grab hold of him, cling to him, never let him go. But that's not what happens. Jesus says to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had sing, said these things to her. Now, admittedly, on, on first reading, the, the statement from Christ can be a little confusing. What does clinging to him have to do with ascending to the Father? Why the distinction between my Father and your Father, my God and your God? Now, friends, we must remember that throughout Christ's final discourse that we looked at from from chapter 13 through chapter, chapter 16, as well as Christ's prayer in chapter 17, Christ made mention of the fact that he was going to return to the Father. The hour was coming. The, the, the time was coming. Chapter 17, the hour is now here. This was going to take place through his death and resurrection, which had now happened. So the last part would be his ascension, his ascension to the Father, but not just yet. She wasn't to cling to him, one, because there was much that needed to be done before that took place. One thing that had to be done was that she had to go and tell the other disciples. She had to go and tell them what she had seen, what she had experienced, what Jesus had told her. Secondly, Christ's ascension meant that the disciples were going to have to learn to live in this life without his physical presence. Verse 17, go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Jesus gives Mary a commission with the privilege of being the first one to see the risen Christ. She now has the task of going and proclaiming this good news to the other disciples. This distinction that Jesus makes between my Father and your Father, my God and your God, seems to indicate how the nature of the relationship between uh, God and the disciples had changed or or was now almost fulfilled because of what Christ has done. His resurrection, showing that his sacrifice on the cross had been accepted by God, now means that for those who trust in the risen Lord, who who turn from their self-reliance, who turn from their sinful pursuits, and turn to the Lord, are now adopted into the family of God. And while the relationship between God the Father and God the Son is distinct from our relationship, we are now members of the same family. Christ is our brother, God as our father. Mary Magdalene, verse 18, went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Friends, Mary wasn't just commissioned to go and give them some facts, to go to the disciples and just tell them a few things. She was going to go and give them the very best News. I mean, can you just imagine what that must have been like when she finds John and Peter? The excitement. John, what you were believing, I too now believe. My sorrow, my grief, it's gone. Why? Because I have seen Christ. Peter, you went away amazed, uncertain. There's no more need for uncertainty. I have seen the Lord. I have spoken to him. And this is what he has told me to tell you. There's no trick of the imagination. As we look at the evidence, the grave clothes, the head cloth, the angels, the empty tomb, the stone, all pointing to the truth, confirmed with a simple word, Mary. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And this is the best news. This changes everything. 
As we consider this truth, as we consider this text, we need to see how the fact that Christ is risen changes everything. It changed everything for Mary. And as we'll see over the last few weeks in this gospel, it changes everything for the disciples. But for us here in Dubai in 2022, how is this meant to impact us? Well, friends, firstly, we have hope. We have an eternal hope. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, tells them, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all, of all people most to be pitied. Friends, if Christ was not raised, then our faith is futile. But we see we have a glorious hope because we have a glorious God. And our hope is not based on our efforts. It's not based on our deeds. Christ came to earth with a mission. He lived a perfect life without sin, in perfect obedience, in perfect love towards the Father, offering himself up as a perfect sacrifice, paying our debt, dying our debt, being raised, showing that his work was perfect and wholly accepted. Friends, because Christ is risen, with, we have this incredible hope. We can confidently, with Paul, say, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Friends, if you're sitting here today and you haven't yet responded to the voice of the shepherd, if you're sitting here and you haven't yet responded to the one who's calling you by name, let today, let this very moment be when that happens. Christian, because Christ is risen, we can have hope in our struggles with sin as we struggle with the flesh. Why? Because Christ has overcome the flesh. How do we know? Because he's alive. Parents, as you seek to shepherd your children, as you struggle with patience, and grace as you seem to correct them and discipline them for the hundredth time. Remember, there is hope and there is grace because Christ is risen. Friends, in any and every circumstance, in difficult job situations or, or no job situations, in difficult marriages, in singleness, through infertility, through unbelieving friends and family members, and you feel at times that you're just at the end of your tether, there is hope because Christ is risen. Our greatest need has been taken care of. Our relationship with God, that relationship that was broken in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve's willful disobedience, now restored. And our eternity in His presence is secured. Friends, let me encourage you. Take this good news. Take the hope that Christ is risen. Go, go today after the service. Don't just go home and think about what's to come in this work week. Find some people here. Go grab lunch and share how Christ's resurrection gives you hope. Share the struggles that you are facing, that you're experiencing, and encourage each other with how we can have hope, why we can find joy. Why? Because Christ is alive. Encourage one another today with this glorious truth. Hold on to the hope, whatever this week may bring. As we finish, there is one more thing I, I want to encourage us with. As we look at the, the evidence, consider the facts of, of eyewitnesses, let me encourage those of us who believe. Friends, let's follow the command that was given to Mary. Let's go out 
and share the glorious news that Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you humbled as we consider not only did Christ come to take our punishment, to take our death, we know that that was accepted by you as Christ is now risen. Oh Lord, what glorious news that Christ is is risen. Father, I do pray that as we consider these truths, as we consider this glorious hope, that it would impact our lives. May we walk out of here in the joy and the knowledge that death is defeated, that our eternal hope is secure because of Christ. Father, may we be a people who seek to apply these truths to our lives, fill our hearts with hope, pour out your Spirit upon us, that we would be bold in proclaiming this good news, that we would find joy and comfort in difficult circumstances, knowing that Christ is risen. Oh, Father God, we do pray that we would walk away in awe, giving you all the glory and honor that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen.